Thanks so much for joining. Uh, this is going to be a whirl whirlwind tour of various AI and machine learning methods uh, as applied to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there'll be four uh, talks, each uh, 12 minutes, uh, and I have my clock here to stay uh, on time. This first one is on behalf of AI for AD, which is one of the uh, UO1 uh, awards as part of the ADSP. Just to give uh, credit to Degui Xi and Fei Xiong Sheng, so this was actually a workshop given at the ASHG, the American Society for Human Genetics, uh, the, those that we chairing it. And it, it was absolutely packed to the gills. And, and Marilyn suggested we do it again. Uh, it compressed down to an hour, which will be a little bit shorter uh, for ADSP. Uh, so uh, you'll hear from four speakers in 12 minutes. Just as a note, do chat any questions and we'll answer them. And then there'll be time after the four uh, talks to uh, speak questions if you, if, you, if you want to. And this was also covered uh, in, in Nature. Uh, Max Kozlov uh, did a very nice article about this uh, this workshop, and so do have a look if, if you are interested. So a summary of, of at least my talk is, how can we merge worldwide neuroimaging and genetic data to understand brain diseases? Uh, I'll show you some work from the Enigma Consortium. And then how can AI methods improve our genetic analysis of brain diseases? So we'll show some AI algorithms that are applied to genetics, neuroimaging, and clinical data from our AI for AD project. And I'll just start with how the large-scale genomic analyses of the brain are usually performed without AI using traditional methods. So one example is the Enigma Consortium. Uh, you may be familiar with the Charge Consortium, which is similar. Um, and we've been running this for 15 years. We've studied many different brain disorders and, and published the largest neuroimaging studies of the disorders shown at the bottom. But the data is all over the world. Uh, people with brain scans and genomic data in these locations uh, an analyzing it cooperatively. Um, and this also can be done to look at the signatures here, cortical thickness patterns in different brain disorders, as you see here. And you can even uh, get the T-shirt for that. Now, as well as the disease studies um, with MRI, DTI, resting state, EEG, and MEG, we can look at how genetic variation affects the brain. So you can screen millions of markers across the genome, either with GWAS or epigenome-wide association uh, or copy number variant searches, and find genetic markers uh, and environmental factors that affect the brain's development and aging, a risk for diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and even treatment response. So you're all familiar with this, doing genomics on biomarkers there at the bottom uh, in, in an image um, might find genetic variants that affect the brain more directly. Uh, they may be more precisely and reproducibly measured. And of course, these uh, endophenotypes or biomarkers um, may, may be more tractable for genomic uh, discovery. So Enigma computes brain measures from scans, MRI on the top left, diffusion imaging on the top right. Every site runs a GWAS, and then we meta-analyze the effects, uh, where the vote from each site uh, depends on the sample size. And this data, just if you want to look at it, is, for example, hippocampal volume. Here, hippocampal volume in 37,000 people. Uh, this paper was in Lancet Digital Health last week. Uh, it's an a, a enormous effort called Centile Brain from Enigma's Lifespan Group uh, that, that merges MRI measures from 35 countries. And this is what they look like. So you could ask what genomic loci influence uh, the measures here. This is uh, thalamic volume. These are volumes of other things that might be relevant to, in particular, Alzheimer's disease. And as all of you know, and you don't need reminding, this is a univariate association test at each polymorphic locus. Uh, and you declare a hit uh, when there's an association statistically between the brain measure uh, and the hit. So this, this works. We teamed up with CHARGE. Uh, in nature, we published brain GWAS um, in a little under 33,000 people. Uh, with hits for hippocampus and all the other major structures of the brain. Um, th this paper by uh, Nadia Johansson and, and Christina Graspi um, on the left uh, in science maps the genomic architecture of the cortex, the cortical thickness in particular. Uh, and Claudia Satisabal, who many of you know, uh, led a. Uh, I have a so uh, some, of, some of the major findings are that the APOE effect on the brain varies with uh, age, it increases from hardly anything at all. Uh, to two standard deviation shift in hippocampal volume uh, by the time you're 70 or 80. Um, there are genomic uh, screens for all the major brain measures. Uh, we've heard from Carlos Krishaga and others talking about GWAS of amyloid and tau. Um, there are now over uh, 500 discovered loci associated with hippocampal volume. An apologenic score based on these uh, accounts for around 5 to 10 percent of the brain structural variation uh, in healthy controls. And so um, you can look at the speed of brain aging. This is a nice pa paper from Nature Neuroscience. And you could look at white matter hyperintensities. So how can AI help with all this? So you can certainly do this in a different way. Rather than mass univariate testing, 
Uh, you can feed all the biomarker data you have, genomic, omic, imaging, even real-time data, uh, into an a AI program that will predict diagnosis, prognosis, uh, or, or treatment response from that data. Uh, how these work, are you often use convolutional neural nets or other AI models where you feed in huge amounts of, of data. In our context, it's uh, neuroimaging and biomarker data. And you train the neural net to recognize features in that data that help you predict an outcome, which might be diagnosis of AD. Uh, the mathematics uh, are interesting. Here's a nice video if you want to look at the mathematics of how this is done. Uh, but essentially, you train the parameters of a model to predict, for example, Alzheimer's disease uh, and go and discover features in images and biomarkers that are, that are helpful. So you can uh, apply AI to detect Alzheimer's disease in a brain scan. This is the largest uh, ever study of that. It's 91% uh, accurate, accurate in discovering Alzheimer's disease on brain MRI. There's a lot of benchmarking. Uh, our ADSP project benchmarks lots of algorithms, not just to detect AD, which is fairly easy, but to detect uh, amyloid tau subtypes and, and, and uh, prognosis. Um, this just last week is a paper benchmarking dozens of AI methods for detecting and subtyping uh, ADRD. Uh, these are tests on large-scale ADSP data. And you can also not just detect Alzheimer's in an image, you can ask for a map uh, of where uh, the, the evidence is. Uh, this is a vision transformer. Um, you can uh, essentially reverse the disease and, and look for features that uh, were different in the earlier uh, data. And this has recently been approved by the FDA. It's not, not just an academic exercise. You can buy AI software to detect AD if you're a radiologist, uh, and they're even uh, doing direct-to-consumer uh, marketing. Now, Alzheimer's is relatively easy to detect. Dugo Tosun uh, and her uh, lab at UCSF has been training uh, neural network models um, to detect measures that we can't see in vivo, uh, such as the neuropath subtypes uh, available there in, in ROSMAP and ADNI. And this could obviously assist with treatment selection, uh, identify subgroups of likely responders, or even do genomic uh, testing on a more refined uh, assessment of the phenotype. She's also been um, training AI methods to predict uh, fast progression. So if you were running an anti-tau trial, you'd want to enroll fast tau progressors. And she's written an algorithm to do just that. So how does all this neuroimaging help uh, find genomic targets uh, and, and, and drug discovery? So Taiho Zhou and Andy Saken trained uh, an AI method to um, essentially predict Alzheimer's disease from tau pet. And it goes and finds a region, a region of interest in the pet data that is most uh, informative. But then what they do is they turn the AI methods into the genome. So this is uh, SNP data. They run a CNN, a convolutional neural network, which slides windows over the fragments of the genome. And, and much like you would do in univariate GWAS, it asks whether there's an association between the response of the feature kernel uh, and Alzheimer's disease in this case. So there's sliding window association test. Uh, you can compare it head to head with Plink. Uh, it's not bad, it's very fast. It aggregates multiple sources of evidence across the genome in predicting AD, but rather than a linear polygenic risk, it will then aggregate in a way that is uh, potentially nonlinear um, if you have enough data, uh, the markers and signatures uh, that predict the phenotype. They've also been looking at transformers. Uh, those of you familiar with chatbots know that attention is used and it aggregates information across its input uh, to make a decision. So they've been making uh, essentially attention maps uh, of genomic loci uh, that are predictive of AD. And you can imagine this could be used like an alpha fold to find uh, signatures in, in proteomic data also. Now, I've talked a lot about Alzheimer's disease versus not. Those of you very familiar with PET will know that there's been interest in subtyping. So this wonderful paper by Jake Vogel and colleagues uh, essentially does unsupervised clustering using sustain that will do subtyping and staging of your uh, tau PET. Uh, this can also be done with MRI. And Christos Tavatsikos and Jun Hao Wen, uh, who was at UPenn and is now at USC, have been running uh, GWAS to find uh, genomic loci associated with different subtypes. And they is a very interesting method that is summarized here. They they run uh, Plink, for example, uh, on scores that come out of an AI method that, that subtypes uh, uh, the types of atrophy. And they've demonstrated that these subtypes uh, correlate well with distinct clinical uh, CSF and plasma uh, signatures. The other thing that these uh, atrophy subtypes can help with uh, is in prognosis. Uh, so the subtyping R1 and R2 over on the left can be added to all the other relevant and interesting predictors uh, to make a decision. And this would be a very fast uh, supplement to many of the uh, conventional predictors of decline if you could read in an MRI, get the subtype and plug it into your uh, uh, model, which is, is not, again, just an academic exercise. This could be used 
as in Dugu Tosun's work for clinical trial stratification uh, and increasing power uh, by enrolling rapid decliners. Now, what about the biology? Now, Yunga Chen will speak next, and I, I've only talked about mathematics. But if if you have a prior interest in certain pathways, uh, sets of genomic loci, or particular drug targets, you can feed them in. And then on the imaging side, you could put in your particular interest. Your interest might be tau or amyloid or, or vascular disease. So rather than search both uh, genome and images uh, indiscriminately, you can favor or, or enforce uh, the, the linkages being detected between two sources of data. So this, this paper is really quite remarkable. This is not from our AI for AD group, it's from uh, Jason Moore and Ma uh, Marilyn Ritchie's uh, AI uh, initiative as part of the ADSP. So just to wrap up, um, conventional GWAS analysis such as Enigma, which we're still doing, uh, has discovered uh, with the CHARGE consortium over three, uh, 500 genomic loci associated with brain structure and function in worldwide data from 45 countries. PRS or polygenic risk scores from these linear GWAS explain up to 9% of the variance in brain uh, phenotypes like hippocampal volume. And they also overlap with ADPD risk loci. So that's a very beneficial exercise to find uh, what these risk loci are doing in the brain. AI enhanced genetic analyses can detect disease in over 100,000 MRIs. And so they, they will yield proxy phenotypes uh, for GWAS as we saw, oops, sorry about that. Uh, as we saw in Tristostovatsikos' work and others, uh, the subtyping from the imaging might give you a disentanglement of the genomic profiles that are relevant. Um, it can also detect molecular pathology subtypes such as amyloid uh, tau, but also TB TBP43 uh, when trained on neuropath data. So you saw in Dugu Tosun's work uh, using neuropath data from ADSP uh, to find um, distinct subtypes that you can go and do genetic genetics with. And then you don't, don't have to ignore the bi biology. You can build in known uh, pathways, uh, which is a nice segue to Yunga Chun, who will speak next, uh, to seek uh, drivers within particular um, ontological pathways or, or among the targets of certain uh, treatments or downstream uh, effects of certain genes. And so I, I mentioned work by Li Shen, Jason Moore, and Marilyn Ritchie in that regard. So that, that's it. Um, I will stop and pass the baton uh, to Dr. Gyunga Chun. And uh, there'll be time for questions at the end. If you'd like to ask any in the chat, we'll we'll have a go. Over to you, Gyunga. Uh, 